Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us at Think Tech Hawaii. Time for responsible change. <clears throat> We're not only going to talk about some of the things that women in leadership offer and bring to the table that are so much in need now. <clears throat> we have four truly exceptional women leaders to share their thoughts, experiences, insights, and perspectives on that with us. <clears throat> and I'm going to start today with Louise Ng because Louise just received the highest honor the National Asia Pacific Bar Association can offer, the Daniel K. Anoe Award. That's a Lifetime Achievement Award. That's not an Oscar, that's a Lifetime Achievement Award. So among women leaders, Louise is up there with Merle Streep and that would be the equivalent in the entertainment industry. <clears throat> but Louise does it in an area where women in law, women in business, and women in leadership, at the time when Louise first started out, just a few years ago when she was only 12, <laughs> was still, particularly in Hawaii, where in between the white male leadership and the Asian male leadership, there were a lot of doors that were kept firmly closed. So we also have with us Rebecca Ratliff, outstanding leading insurance executive for many years, now a leading mediator and arbitrator, including for JAMS, probably the largest organization of mediators and arbitrators in the world. Tina Patterson with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, also a business coach and consultant and a lady capable of wearing and training people in many different facets of how to live in challenging societies and contexts. And Sandra Sims, a retired judge, an author, now working on another book, as we hear, and we're all looking forward to that. So I'm just feeling incredibly lucky to be a companion to four of the most outstanding, inspiring, shining women any of us could get to know. How did you get here from where you started? Louise, you want to start us out? Oh, thanks, Chuck. Well, it's, you know, thanks to people like you who uh, helped us out. Instead of, uh, you know, trying to put us in our place, um, you know, I really, as a young lawyer, boy, I really did appreciate the, uh, you know, the more senior lawyers who were supportive because, as you say, there were so many where, you know, through their subtle comments or the like, made you feel like you didn't quite get here on your own merit um, or, you know, you just weren't as tough um, as they were. Um, but yeah, how did we do it? I think, you know, um, for those of us who are lucky to have it, parental support, um, the ones that just keep you going and give you love and feeling like you are loved and able to go forward. Um, and I also have to say that having a good partner at home who helps share the duties and supports your career and your family is really important too. And then partners who are willing to give you the opportunity and, you know, not put a glass ceiling over women or, um, you know, because you're a minority. Um, you know, it's all of those pillars that um, help us. And I have to say the Sisterhood of Women, the Sisterhood of Women Lawyers has been valuable as well. Wow. And you've got a daughter who is carrying that torch forward with quite a light of her own. Want to tell us a little bit about her? Well, sure. I'm always happy to talk about my daughter, um, especially because it probably embarrasses her. She's in a totally different field. So she is more in the creative side. She's a dancer. Um, she's also getting joy these days out of teaching English as a second language. But what I was really happy about with that my kids did, um, you know, during the Trump years and during this whole period of the past year of seeing rising incidents of anti-Asian and and hate incidents against just minorities in general, is that they took it to heart and they took action in their own way as well. 
So my daughter, um, you know, made donations to, um, you know, groups that supported Asian Americans in the community. She taught classes and raised money um, for um, Asian Americans advancing justice, as well as a Chinatown, New York Chinatown group. And, and then my son, I should give him a shout out too, because he's been with the Red Sox front office. And for the first time, he got involved with their diversity committee because they did not have Asian American representation. And even though he's Hapa, um, you know, he's, he's been able to reconnect with his um, Chinese American roots. Wow. Awesome. Hey. And Rebecca, you've got some bragging rights as well, yeah? Cameron, we've met and just an outstanding young man. Yes, Uncle Chuck. Um, <laughs> you're just <laughs> as proud as my, of my son as I am, which, which I love and appreciate you for. Um, but much of what Louise has said, I had a mother who just always got behind us and pushed and, and um, never you know, told us what we couldn't do. It was always, um, there was always encouragement. And I had, my, my dad was much older than my mom and he was actually born in uh, 1918, which people are shocked to hear. So he would be 103 had he lived, but I, I just had amazing I'm, parents. I'm the daughter of a pastor and a nurse. Um, so community servants, people who believed um, in serving people and servant leaders, um, but they kept us grounded. Hum I came from humble beginnings uh, in the suburbs of Chicago, Illinois. I grew up and I, I tell people often that my oldest two siblings, there are five of us, the oldest two were born in the projects of the west side of Chicago, um, the high rises, but that's a doctor and a lawyer. And I'm very proud of that because um, my parents instilled everything that they had in us and we had everything that money couldn't buy. Um, and, and it was, you know, all the things that, that people want naturally, but, uh, but you can't buy. And um, I, I value that upbringing very, very much and the morals. And, and I'm, with, I'm with Louise, a family that is supportive. My siblings, my, uh, my husband, um, you know, enabled, uh, you know, that, that partnership has enabled us to raise uh, a great son who is, a, he's just a great human being. Um, so surrounding myself with positive people, Louise, like you said, I, I, I consider you all, you know, part of, part of that, um, you know, Sandra and Tina and Chuck, are, we're all family. And I value that because when you surround yourself with positive people, um, who are going places, then, then you too can continue to be inspired. And so that's uh, what I attributed to my faith. I need to make sure I mention that as well. Yeah. yeah. And Sandra, I'm guessing that register is pretty close to home for you as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, having that initial family support when you, when you're young and, and they're people, you're just starting out and you're, I had parents that encourage you. I was the first of my family, you know, to go and uh, complete complete college. My mother started, but she didn't finish. And my dad was one of those folks who valued education, but he grew up in a community in Illinois where even though he had, you know, graduated from the high school in Bloomington, Illinois, at a very, you know, high level, because the universities did not accept Blacks in those days in college, he could not go. There was just, he couldn't because they didn't accept him. And so he chose to do another career. He, and so when I came along, he was the biggest supporter, go for it, go for it. They, my parents really sacrificed a lot for me to finish college. And then of course they told me when I got to law school, it's like, okay, we got you this far. I think you better pick it up from here. But, but they were always supportive. And I think that was, um, I agree with, with, with Louise and Rebecca having that, is, is absolutely critical. So now when I see uh, women who come out of really difficult situations, I work with a number of organizations, uh, including the Lynx and Seroptimists and so forth, who really work with women who are having to come to issues like you know, domestic violence and drug abuse, and they still get to that place of accomplishing something. Uh, I am just, I am enamored and it is inspiring to see that. And I'm glad to be a part of those groups that do that. And I know all of you are doing that as well. Louise has always been involved uh, with the organizations in, in, in Hawaii that support women who are working to get ahead. So that's kind of, I think that's our background. Of course, my, my father was a, 
you know, deacon in the church or that was very involved in church. And our church was also one of those ones that was in the Chicago community, very involved in uh, civil rights movement. And so I saw that. I remember the first time that, you know, Dr. King came to our church to speak. It was just an electrifying moment. I was a teenager at that time, as an hour revealing I'm quite older than most of you, but nonetheless, uh, <laughs> it was it was it was an electrifying moment um, to just see him come and to the presence that he had and the ability that he had to bring people in that community in Chicago um, together to move forward. And that's how we've been inspired. And then coming here to Hawaii, um, meeting folks, my husband was, um, you know, big support. I mean, I've you know he I I, I lost him last year, but. You know, he was always the one to like, oh, well, go for it. This comes along, go for it, <laughs> go for it. And and really tremendous support even here in, in Hawaii. I had the I had the fortune of uh, getting a law clerk position with just with the late Justice Hayashi. And um, he was just a tremendous um, inspiring resource. Now Louise has pointed out there, you know, the the men in our in our profession who've encouraged and supported women. He was certainly among those. So certainly a mentor for me. And, um, you know, I've always, I, you know, we, I value that relationship I was able to establish with him and the encouragement that he gave in my career going on to the bench, he was there. So I, you know, it's important. And I am grateful for the support that I've had all these years, yeah. Tina, you've opened some doors that <clears throat> I think people who didn't know you <clears throat> might find really surprising that a Black professional woman could achieve these things in areas where those doors <clears throat> were shut pretty tightly. <clears throat> what influences or people have been part of that becoming possible for you? Much like everyone else, I would say um, my family of origin, but I also wanna talk about family of choice and the women and you Chuck that are here would be part of that circle, family of choice. Um, it's the, the like, much like Sandra, I'm the first in my family to um, complete college. And most recently I obtained my master's degree. So um, that literally pushed me a little bit further forward. But I would say it, it's, it's both those individuals in the immediate family, my mother, my father, who were advocates of education growing up in the deep South, um, it wasn't always available to them. And so they were very much, um, it was very much a part of their, their dialogue with us. We were going to get education. We were going to graduate right. from high school. We were going to college, which college we went to was a matter still of discussion, but we were going to college. And my father would frequently say, education is something that no one can take away from you. You need to have an education. But the doors opening beyond that, and this is where the circles begin, the, 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 the family of choice, those people, as was mentioned earlier, the men and women who said, you know, I see something in you. I, I want you to to take this opportunity. And I, I think about ben, um, Bernice Baston Martinez. She is with the University of California system and how I received an email from a colleague saying, you know, you should apply for this women's leadership program. It was called Leadership America it is now formed um, as leadership women. And my first response was no. <laughs> and I got an email saying, you think about it. And my response again was no. 10 o'clock on a, I don't remember the call, which weeknight it was, I received a phone call and it was Bernice and she wanted to talk to me. And she said, you don't see it, but others do. I mm. want you to take the chance. Ew. I want you to go wow. ahead and fill out that application. I was silent for about 15 minutes. She said, I know you're there because I hear you breathing. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you, you need to go ahead and to complete this application <laughs> and yes. let's see what happens. And it's, it's a journey. I think, you know, we, we talk about the wonderful side of women's leadership, but there's also, and I think I've talked about it here and, and people may say, why are you talking about this? Because there's the imposter syndrome. There's the, mm -hmm. the introvert syndrome as well. You're in a room and I clearly recall getting my results back from the strength finder. 
And the woman who was talking was saying, you know, everybody in here has this except for one person. And she actually called my name and I could feel myself slowly sinking in my chair because my number one strength was not the extroversion that everyone else had. It was collaboration. And you know, she, I went up later to talk to her about it. And I said, why don't you call my name in this room of 68 people? And she said, well, I, I wanted to point this out because not every leader has the same path and we need to identify and mm -hmm. feel comfortable with that uniqueness. You know, at this a concept that everybody's going to be cookie cutter in terms of their behavior, yes. their actions and how they, how they work through problems is something that we have to literally let go of. Um, and for women in particular, it's the balance that you've heard from every person, the balance of family, job, and also where, where they are on their individual mm -hmm. personal journey, trying to balance that. And, and we often don't talk about that. So um, for me, it's, it's that sister circle. It's the it's that family of choice. It's the family of birth. Um, and sometimes there are people who I've never met who I literally look up to. Um, I, I think about a documentary I saw that for me was very both affirming, but also um, a reminder to me that I'm not the only one. And I'm talking specifically mm -hmm. about the Toni Morrison document, The Pieces I Am, where she talks about the doubt and the, the moments of angst where she literally had to make a decision about who she was in the face of what the world thought she was and could she reconcile that? And that's something that I think all of us at some point go through, who we are, our personal persona and the public persona. Um, you know, the public oftentimes, and I'm a public official in my community, the public wants to know everything about you. And sometimes you have to say, you know what, that's enough. That, that's enough. So um, I'm going to stop because this is not my evening. This is about all of us. So I wanted to hear more. Yeah, we, we, we could be here for hours easily. <laughs> yeah. Hey, except Eric's going to want his channel back before. Exactly. <laughs> so. Maybe ask each of you, think of a woman whose life has influenced yours in ways that have made things possible that might not otherwise have been possible. Louise, want to start us off? Oh, I was going to go last. There, there have been so many, um, you know, and it's, it's older and both older and younger women. I look at you know many of the younger women up and coming and thinking, man, I was clueless compared to them. So, you know, we have a lot to learn from them as well. You know, they're maybe they're just not as afraid or they don't have that same imposter syndrome. But golly, you know, who made it um, possible? Well, you have to go back to my mother and, and grandmother, I guess. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, my my Grandmother seemed to have a kind of an unusual family background in the sense that her mom, her, my great grandmother was a doctor and she studied medicine in China and she was in an orphanage and studied medicine, managed to meet uh, my great grandfather and 10 days after they got married, they were on a ship to Hawaii. Um, wow. And then even after that, they could not get licensed right away because there was racism right. about, um, you know, licensing these doctors from China. But it was, you know, some of the missionary families, the Damon family that helped them um, in, in you know, some way, whether it was, wow. you know, convincing them to be able to be examined in Chinese or, or whatever. But, you know, because that was a working parent family, I think my, my mm -hmm. grandmother and others had to kind of raise themselves. And as a result, they had some very, very strong women in that family, you know, maybe unusual, but, but strong. And I think she carried that on to her kids. Um, you know, she taught cooking at YWCA in downtown. And so for the, at that time, she was a working woman outside of the house. And although it was a, you know, kind of a domestic job, yeah. it was, you know, she influenced and touched a lot of people who still talk about the cookbook that she wrote that they have. 
Um, wow. So I think it was that. And then I think it's, you know, some of my classmates I have to think, you know, give a shout out to Connie Lau, who is the, uh, you know, what our, our yes. first Asian American uh, public company CEO, at least in Hawaii, um, you know, and a very, you know, maybe the first Asian American woman heading a utility company or conglomerate. But um, we were the same. Actually, we've kind of been together since kindergarten and college and all that. Um, but she has always been just such a positive, um, you know, successful role model. And I say she's just set it up perfectly because not only has she just announced her retirement and created a, you know, with the board's help, a succession plan that puts two women in uh, CEO positions in that family of companies yeah, um, and Tara Nishi at American Savings and I think Shelly Kimura at Hawaiian Electric, the utility company. But she has put a, you know, Asian Native Hawaiian CEO who's going to take her place at, at the public company. Um, not only that, but she got her kids to come back, well, her, her daughter to come back and, you know, with a baby and then had a baby here. And her husband and, and finance factors has set up a succession plan for that family. And so she gets to be a grandma and have her kids here, too. So, you know, she's wow. got uh, she's got it set up on the succession planning. And she's been so positive and smart. Wow. Rebecca? Well, I love that. I, I almost feel like Louise is in my like notes or my head. Um, <laughs> cause I'll, I'll have to, um, kind of match that my, um, I'll go back to my mom and dad, my parents, but, um, in particular, my maternal grandparents, um, they, my mother had a college degree, um, from Wheaton college, which is still very well known in Illinois. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Illinois, Maywood. Um, and went to the famous Proviso East High School. People don't know where Maywood, Illinois is, but they know if exactly. you're a basketball fan, Doc exactly. Rivers. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Maywood. <laughs> and uh, yeah, born and raised. Uh, but my mom had an opportunity, had opportunities, and all of her siblings were college educated as well because their parents were a maid and butler. And um, so that, you know, domestic uh, work. And the people that my grandparents worked for made sure that their kids got college degrees and it okay. changed the you know the trajectory of all, I mean all me and my siblings all have college degrees um, and so it 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 started a a pattern um, of you know for education and uh, and it's just incredible and then I had amazing teachers I actually um, coming up through I, I know I don't look old enough but coming up <laughs> in the in the 70s um in in elementary school had a black principal and so i had a black principal and black teachers who um taught me people who looked like me who were educated and who were educators and it was a family community in maywood illinois and those teachers went on to run the district um and so i saw excellence all around me growing up in, in a community where everybody knew each other and the fathers, um, you know, were the, the guardians of the, of the blocks that we lived on and um, just had such a, a rich, again, we didn't have a lot of money. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Illinois at Urbana and I didn't know that we were poor till I got to college. And so <laughs> some students, um, you know, and imagine that a college student with a car um, but I didn't realize that we had less <laughs> material things until I got to college. And, um, you know, but thank goodness I was raised to be a solid individual. And I've taught my son, we've taught our son that comparison is a thief of joy. So we've, you know, exactly. not, you know, uh, you know, I don't compare myself to my friends. And so just solid um, principles that, you know, that I, that I grew up with um, is, you know, what I would have to attribute in the people who, who made things possible were a community. How about you, Sandra? Women who have inspired and taken you beyond what might have otherwise been possible. You know, um, I have to go along. I got, I have, I had a fantastic mother, Vera, Vera Knuckles, and you know, she didn't have the college degree. She did go to college, but she certainly encouraged me and was supportive of me. But I want to also shout out to shout not shout out, but recognize that when I moved here, um, that was a tremendous move for me and my family, all of my families in Chicago area. And so we came here. We didn't know, well, my husband knew people because he came here with United Airlines. 
And I did not have that kind of connection uh, with establishing, you know, relationships with people. One of the women that I met here in Hawaii who has had a tremendous, who had a tremendous influence on me was Naomi Campbell. Um, she has since passed away, but she came here in the 1950s from New York. She was an attorney uh, and uh, head of the Corporation Council's Family Support. She was involved in working in support for child support years before it's the thing that people want to do now. She pioneered so many areas in the law uh, with regard to uh, supporting children. And she had this incredible commanding presence when she went into court. She was the only person I knew at that time who could go to court and wear a muu. Everyone else had to be in soon, <laughs> soon time. But I mean, there were very fancy moves, but she would walk into it. She, she had this integrity and this professionalism that was just unmatched. She came here because she was in an interracial marriage and was not accepted in her own communities in New York. And so she and her husband moved here. Uh, Charles Campbell went on to become a, a state senator and involved. He was, you know, he was African American, but she had this, this presence, this integrity, this grace in this field in which at that time, I think when I came here, Louise, you may remember, there were probably only a handful of women who were even attorneys back in the yeah. late 70s, 80s. We're talking, you could count them on your hand. And she was one of them. And I had the I had the good grace to work for her and to just see how that uh, I don't want to take about time because Tina, but anyway, she was an incredible influence on me and how I later came out to be, maybe. That's wonderful. In our last minute, Tina. Oh gosh. I, I'm gonna I, I'm going to talk about my mother and grandmother, but I also want to talk about um, a, another person who was instrumental because. Um, much like you, Rebecca, um, my parents provided for us in many ways, but it wasn't until I stepped foot on an Ivy League institution campus that I realized just how little Oops. we had. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, and it was a family friend, Miss Thompson, who was a member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. Okay. And the local chapter um, decided that they were giving scholarships. And we knew nothing about scholarships. She was instrumental in me getting scholarships to help pay for my books because I was completely blown away with the cost of books once I arrived on campus, even though I had worked and saved up money. But going along with that same theme, I think the other person who's really been instrumental, um, and this has been more of a role model from a distance, is Dr. Ruth Simmons, who was the first African-American woman to serve as president of an Ivy League institution, as a matter of fact, my alma mater. Mm -hmm. She, I had an a couple of opportunities to actually chat with her and, and talking to her was very similar. We're both from Louisiana. She went to schools in Louisiana, but the, the fact that she persevered and being, I think there, there were 13 children and she was one of the latter born children her tenacity and her perseverance was something that I carried with me when I transitioned from private sector to the um, alternative dispute resolution field. It was one of my instructors. Her name is Lucrecia Gilbert. She's still alive and um, she has been a supporter, a mm -hmm. number one cheerleader, but also that person that I can call sometimes and say, you know, I'm taking this class. What was I thinking? And she'll just say, you can do this. Keep, keep at it, Tina. Let me know when you're done. And so it's that circle again. Um, again, it, yes. You know, in, as far as my corporate career, I, I think it was Dale Murgo, who was one, one of my first supervisors, um, who literally said, you know, you have an aptitude for numbers. Why don't you go to graduate school? And I kind of pretended I didn't hear her. And she, she, when she moved from one bank to another, she took me with her until I moved out of the area. And she said, if you ever wanna come back, let me know. And just having that steady support, someone saying, you know what, you can do this when there's a lot of factors telling you, you can't, you shouldn't, what are you doing here? You know, th that those people behind you or in front of you saying, come on, pick, you know, shake the dust off, stand up, let's go. I, I always think about this proverb, fall down uh, seven times, stand up eight. And sometimes that's what we ah. need is that person who says, 
you know, stand up, get back up. You can do this. That's wonderful. Wow. We're out of time for today. We're wow, I'm back. inspired. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm so you see awesome. guys. Oh, goodness gracious. <sighs> Thank you all. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah. Thank you. Aloha. Come back and see us in two weeks. We'll be back with more. Congratulations.